Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming here this morning. Uh, my name is Jason Bordoff. I'm a professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, where I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy. And I'm Melissa Lott, and I'm our director of research at the center where I work with Jason. 2023 may well be the year of climate action. With historic policy initiatives like the Inflation Reduction Act in our country, record amounts of capital being deployed into clean energy, huge technological breakthroughs like fusion, and rising social mobilization because of the urgency of the crisis. Melissa and I hear reason for optimism like this every day in New York City, where we help to run the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia. Optimism about the pace of cost declines, technological advancement, the growth of clean energy. And if you spend your time with investors and entrepreneurs, just think of the conversations we've had the last few days here with the WEF, you can't help but feel hope that we're finally beginning to make progress on the climate crisis, that we are finally, finally building the resolve needed to decarbonize in the time frame that we need to toward net zero. But here's the problem. Two things can both be true at the same time. Clean energy can exceed our wildest hopes and expectations. Costs can come down faster than we thought. Growth can happen faster than we thought. And emissions keep going up. Oil, gas, even coal use keep going up. And that's where we are today. That's what happens when populations grow and societies industrialize, become more prosperous. It's also the reality of how long energy transitions take and always have throughout time. That's the daunting reality of how hard it is to make progress within the time frames that we need to. It's the reality of the, how hard the speed and scale necessary for this clean energy transition is. But given that the consequences of failure are so high, the existential question for our time today is how do we reconcile this enormous progress we're making in clean energy with the reality of what's really required to achieve our net zero goals? So we're not here to tell you what you probably already know, which is that the energy system, which is the backbone of our economy, is in the early stages of a massive transformation. I say the early stages really intentionally because what we're here to talk about today is what is needed to achieve net zero. What are we talking about when we talk about scale, speed, scope? And what are the bumps that we expect to hit along the way? And how do we navigate them successfully? So I want to start by talking about the progress that we have seen to date. So what we have seen in terms of the scaling of clean energy, going from first of kind to millions, and honestly, when I talk through this progress, it's hard not to pause. Because when I think back to when I started my career 20 years ago, this progress, the things we have already achieved, they seemed impossible. So first, I want to talk about how we've scaled renewables and how we've grown clean power. When you look at the amount of renewables that we installed between 2001 and 2021, it was about 2,400 gigawatts. That's roughly the size of China's entire grid. And when we look at what we expect to see in the future, we expect to actually develop that same number of gigawatts in five years. 20 years for the first, five for the next. That's tremendous. At the same time, we have seen explosion when it comes to electric vehicles. We have seen more than 25 million electric vehicles hit the roads, and we expect the growth of annual sales of electric vehicles to increase 35% this coming year. These are huge numbers. And they're thanks to what you see behind me. They're thanks to really quick cost declines across a lot of different technologies. So when you look at the cost of solar, we've seen from 2010 to 2020, one decade, an 80% decline in the cost of a new solar power plant. At the same time, over that same decade, we saw a 75% decrease in the cost of a lithium ion battery pack. This is tremendous progress. This is absolutely huge. And it gives us a lot of hope for what we're going to see in the future. But it is not nearly enough. This is a lot of progress, but it is not the scope and scale that we need. So while we're doing a lot, we're not nearly doing enough, which is why we see headlines like this. 
We're hitting milestone after milestone in deploying clean energy. And yet, it still seems like we're barely making a dent in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, to be clear, the projected growth in emissions, the projected growth in temperature rise, is lower today than it was a decade ago. So progress is possible. But we're still very far from decarbonizing the energy system at the speed and scale that we need to. And we're already seeing the consequences, with record heat leading to melting ice sheets, sea level rise, food insecurity, biodiversity and ecosystem loss, more severe droughts, flooding, heat waves. The consequences for humanity of failing to achieve targets like 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial times can be quite dire. And at our current rate of emissions, we reach that threshold in less than a decade. Now remember, the North Star we're working toward is the cumulative amount of emissions, the stock that has accumulated over time. That's what drives the impacts of climate change. 2022 was a record year for annual emissions. So not only is the stock, the cumulative amount that has accumulated over time going up, the amount we are contributing to it each and every year is still going up. All of this underscores a hard truth, that for all the growth in EVs and renewables and other forms of clean energy that Melissa was talking about, we need to move so much faster, especially for things like steel and cement and aviation and shipping, things that are harder to electrify and harder to decarbonize. The good news here is that we have the technologies that we need to get on the road and to move quickly to net zero. We know how to get there. We know how to make this change. This is something, again, I couldn't say 20 years ago. We've made a ton of progress. So when we look at all the research, all the analysis, all the pathways to net zero, what we see is that to transform an economy, you do three broad things. First, you electrify everything that makes sense to electrify. That is a lot of our economy. It's the heat in our homes. It's the vehicles we drive. It's a lot of our industrial processes. And in that process, we become as efficient as we possibly can. The second pillar is about cleaning up our supplies of energy. So we often focus on changing that coal-fired power plant or natural gas power plant to wind or solar, geothermal, nuclear, all the different technologies we could think of, including maybe fossil fuels with carbon capture. But it means more than that. It means creating the fuels we need for the things that don't make sense to electrify for a whole variety of reasons. So this is about creating the fuels we need for aviation. This is about creating things like hydrogen for industrial processes. It's cleaning up our supplies, all of our electricity, and all the fuels we need, while also stopping the waste of greenhouse gases today. I'm talking about methane. Stopping throwing away free emissions into the air. They're not free. The third pillar is about dealing with the emissions that we just can't get out of our system. So we've electrified it. We've cleaned up all of our energy supplies. There's still stuff left. This is why we talk about something called carbon management, about capturing emissions and storing them underground or turning them into products and storing them there. We also talk about nature-based solutions. So reforestation is just one example. And amongst all of this, we are ensuring that every single person everywhere in the world has access to affordable, reliable, and clean energy. If I had to sum it up in a word, it would be build. And because I'm from California and Texas, it's build stuff. But it's more than that. The transition to net zero means to build a lot of stuff, very quickly, very rapidly, to move faster than we ever have before. Because the energy transition is one where we build. The scale of infrastructure growth that's needed is unprecedented. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around sometimes, <laughs> the scale and magnitude of what we're talking about. And it needs to happen, as Melissa said, so much ha faster than it's ever happened before. Energy transitions take time. If you look back over history, 60, 70, 80 years for new sources of energy to reach critical mass to displace older sources of energy that came before them. There are two reasons for this. First is it takes a long time for the capital stock to turn over, the homes, the vehicles, the heating systems we have, the factories we have. Think of the most recent report from the International Energy Agency. It found that last year, one in seven new cars sold globally was electric. That's a huge achievement, one out of every seven. And the IEH projects that within five years, 
one out of every four new cars sold globally will be electric. Maybe it'll be more than that. And the IA also finds that a decade from now, oil demand will be higher than it is today. And that's partly because we use oil for things other than cars, but it's also because it takes a long time for the stock of vehicles to turn over when people own their cars 13, 14, 15 years on average. It's also what happens when you move from 1 billion cars in the world to 2 billion by 2050, as people move from two and three wheeled vehicles to four wheeled vehicles with rising prosperity. And that takes me to the second reason that transitions take a long time and always have. Energy use keeps going up. Indeed, the history of energy is not one of transitions. It's one of additions. If you think of the energy transition, a phrase we throw around casually all the time, you might think of a figure in your head of something like going from zero to 100% from 1850 until today. And we see these great shifts over time from wood to coal with the Industrial Revolution, and then from coal to oil and gas and nuclear and increasingly renewables and zero carbon forms of energy. Great shifts over time as a percentage of the total. But if you look at the same data, not as a percentage of the total, but total energy use, metric tons of energy, we're using more of everything. Nothing has ever gone down. We've met the growth in energy with new and different forms of energy. But we're using more wood and biomass today than we did in 1850. Because the denominator keeps getting bigger. Energy use keeps going up. That's what happens when populations grow and societies industrialize and become more prosperous and their energy use rises as a result. And to be clear, that is not a bad thing, rising energy use. It means that some of the lowest income countries in the world, that by the way, will be worst impacted by many of the impacts of climate change, that they're becoming better off. But it is also why, despite all the progress and all the pledges and all the targets and all the goals and all the commitments, it's also why the gap between ambition and reality on climate is still growing and not shrinking. So when we talk about that gap and we think about this, what does it mean as we go down the path in front of us? What does it mean as we go to net zero? I see two broad ways that we can close this gap. One is that we make some progress. We go to one in seven cars to one in four being sold that are electric. We build a lot of wind and solar. And we do make progress, but not enough. And so what we do is we learn to live in a very altered future state. So we learn to live with climate change. So I'm talking about floods and droughts. I'm talking about catastrophic wildfires. I'm talking about famine. I'm talking about population displacement of people leaving their homes, talking about unhealthy communities, talking about a ton of stress in the system. The progress we made wasn't enough, so we adapt, and we adapt a lot. The second alternative is something that I think is probably more likely, because the cost of the first scenario of not acting in line with our goals is so huge and unacceptable that the second option seems maybe more likely. So option two on closing the gap is that we move faster than we maybe ever have before, that we build so much stuff, all the things we need to move an economy, and we move and reconfigure that economy in a way that is sustainable. There's a lot of reasons why I think that this second spot is more likely. <coughs> it's not just this. It's not just the unacceptability of not moving. It's actually some of the social shifts that we are already seeing and social pressures that we're seeing to move, as well as the policy actions that we're seeing being taken in our home country, the United States, with the Inflation Reduction Act, across Europe with Repower EU and the Green New Deal, and then also here in China with renewable energy targets that seem poised to be run past so fast. And when I think about all of the social pressures all the technologies we have and what we can do, it feels like we're on the precipice of something really huge. As Melissa said, in my view, climate action is likely to proceed as Ernest Hemingway once wrote Bankruptcy Does. In his famous novel, The Sun Also Rises, there's a character named Mike. And Mike is asked how he went bankrupt. And Mike responds two ways. Gradually, and then all of a sudden. 
And the social mobilization to tackle climate with the urgency we need to may proceed in a similar way. And this growing social mobilization to tackle climate with the urgency we need to, that's just one of many ways in which the transition to net zero is likely to be nonlinear, disruptive, jagged, volatile, all of which makes it harder to have a clean energy transition if we're not careful about it. Just think of what Melissa was talking about before, how quickly we need to build infrastructure, how hard it is to scale global supply chains at 30, 40, 50 percent year-on-year growth, and do it in an era of rising trade tensions and economic fragmentation, as we've talked about here this week over the last few days. Or think about how hard it is to get, at least in some parts of the world, like where we come from, the permits and approvals that you need to build that much stuff that quickly. It takes an average of 16 years to bring a new mining project to development. And as we all know, to have a clean energy transition, we need to dramatically scale the critical minerals that are available, like nickel and copper and lithium and cobalt, that we need for many technologies in, in, in clean energy. A six-fold increase in critical minerals by 2050, according to the International Energy Agency. You can't electrify an economy without a lot of copper. Copper demands projected to grow, to, copper demands projected to double by the end of this decade, and, and we're not even on track for our climate goals yet. Or think about how geopolitics, which is where I spend a lot of my time, and previously worked in government at the National Security Council, think about how geopolitics could complicate the energy transition and make it more jagged and more volatile. Right now, most of those critical minerals, for example, are refined and processed right here in China. And in some parts of the world, like where we come from, there's growing concern about the consequences of that and the geopolitical influence and energy security risks that may result. And governments are going to respond to try to reduce that dependence. Think about the potential geopolitical complications of what we are seeing with rising tensions, rapidly rising tensions, between rich and poor countries, between North and South. Last year, 75 million people around the world lost their ability to pay for basic energy services. The first year in the 20 years that figure has been tracked, that that number went in the wrong direction. There's a growing sense of hypocrisy and resentment among many of the lowest income countries in the world and emerging market countries in the world toward the wealthier ones at how the climate change action is proceeding, how the clean energy transition is proceeding. And these, again, are parts of the world not responsible for most of the world's historic emissions. Around 2% of the accumulated emissions to date are from Africa, nearly half from the United States and Europe. And this problem risks getting worse, not better, this rising tension. Last year, there was $150 billion spent on clean energy in emerging and developing economies. That needs to rise from $150 billion to $1 trillion by the end of this decade to be on track for our climate goals. Where's that money going to come from? In a world where higher currency exchange risk, political risk, higher cost of capital, and where wealthier countries have still failed to make good on pledges they made more than a decade ago for financial assistance to help lower income countries cope with the impacts of climate change and develop their economies in a cleaner way. Think about what the transition from one fuel to another might mean if we don't kind of get right synchronizing the decline in investment in oil supply with declines in demand, we could see more volatility, where the need to call on countries with spare capacity to smooth volatility in oil prices like Saudi Arabia, that goes up before it goes down. Their geopolitical influence rises, even if decades from now declining oil demand might mean less oil revenue for petrostates that have traditionally depended on that revenue and could risk political instability in some of those parts of the world. All of these are just a handful of, of some of the risks, some of the reasons why the broad geopolitical trends of today, great power rivalry, particularly between the US and China, growing trade tensions, more divergence, not convergence, between wealthy and poor countries, growing economic fragmentation. All of that could make it much harder to have the clean energy transition that we need. And I say all of that not because we should slow down the pace of the energy transition. As you've heard, we need to move much faster. But if we don't anticipate these risks, think about 
mechanisms to smooth them, think about how to de-risk the energy transition. We risk being unable to have one, because if energy affordability and reliability and security come into conflict with climate ambition, we've seen from yellow vest protests and many other examples time and again, climate risks being on the losing end. So there are a lot of challenges. But it is also true, Melissa and I believe, that there is real opportunity in crisis. So we look at more forward and we talk about those real challenges and then we talk about the real opportunities. I think about it in a couple of different ways and we talk about this all the time at our work in the Center on Global Energy Policy. So we think about the path ahead and it is very clear that the energy transition is gonna be messy. It's gonna be really hard. Honestly, it's gonna be confusing. There's gonna be moments where we're wondering, are we going forward or back, up or down? This is jagged, this is rough, this is problematic at times. But the outcomes are unacceptable. We talked about that. So how do we lean in to the scale and the scope and the sheer speed of this transition to accomplish our goals, to accomplish our energy and climate goals? We do it in a number of different ways. And at the university, we spend a good amount of our time learning from history looking at things that have happened in the past to understand how things might unfold in the future. And when I look at history, I see a lot of examples of us reconfiguring economies when we have stress in our system, when our lives are threatened, whether it's pandemics or wars. When our lives are threatened, we make big, big moves very, very quickly. And the good news in this case is that we're all on the same team. We're all working towards the same goal. And so I think that makes some of this very difficult, very messy process a bit easier in a way than the things that we study in history. So how do we move forward and how do we actually capture those opportunities? How do we make the progress that we need to? How do we make the choice to move to net zero? As we look forward at what we need to do, we could get scared at the sheer magnitude of what we're trying to do. Or we can lean into the opportunities, the opportunities it creates, because that's the point. It's not about a power plant. It's not about an electrolyzer to make hydrogen or your favorite technology. That's not what it's about. It's about supporting healthy communities. It's about supporting human flourishing and giving us the opportunity for continued growth. And so when we look at the light at the end of this tunnel, or the end of this path to net zero, even along the path, and we think about the opportunities that are being created, we're talking about healthier communities, we're talking about wealth opportunities, we're talking about economic growth, we're talking about not allowing things that could slow us down in achieving our goals of having healthy and wealthy communities, overcoming them to be even healthier and wealthier. And this makes me wonder, back to something Jason said a few minutes ago, progress to date has been slow. But it seems like if we can really lean into understanding the fundamentals of the challenges that are ahead of us, all the things that Jason outlined, I think we're about to move all at once to net zero. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll go to questions. Thank you. is very open for anything that's on your mind, any questions you want to ask. No. So who wants to kick us off? Thank you. We've got a question right here, I think, up in the front. And we'll get you on mic just so we can do the simultaneous transition. Thank and, you so much. Do you mind just introducing yourself? Uh, yes, my name is Kei Suzuki from uh, Japan, uh, doing a private equity fund, uh, in, in investing in sustainability and renewables. Okay, can you, tell, can you tell us a little bit about uh, new technology like hydrogen or ammonia or uh, carbon capture, that kind of things? Um, so when it comes to hydrogen, there's a bunch of different ways that we think about hydrogen. Um, so I'm not sure if your question is about the state of technology or how we think about it in the transition, but for the most part, hydrogen is an energy storage technology. That's what it really is. You take electricity, you take energy inputs, and you turn it into something that you can either use in a different way or store for a very long period of time. 
We talk about storing it as ammonia because we know what to do with ammonia. <laughs> That's something that we've done for a while when you talk about fertilizers and agriculture. We know what to do with that, with that particular set of molecules. Um, so in the future, hydrogen can make a lot of sense in a bunch of different applications. So there's a, a common theme about do we use hydrogen all over the economy? I would say it's more likely to use it in a few key places, at least at first. And that could be in heavy industry where we need really high heats to make the stuff that we want in our lives. Um, after that, you could see it being an energy storage technology to let's say store electricity when it's not available and you've got a bunch of extra at this time of year and you don't have it this time of year, so let's use it as long duration storage. Um, but ammonia is an interesting one. I used to live in Japan, and we talk about OK as being an import-dependent economy. How do you think about what different fuels you can ship around and have around whenever you need them? Because in the pathway to net zero, we're not going to accept a future that is less reliable or really less affordable than it is today. <coughs> so hydrogen is an interesting one, as are a bunch of other fuels I can nerd out about later. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Stephen from Australia, I deal in the mining industry. Um, quick question. Um, you mentioned about for us to reach the uh, uh, net zero objectives in the future, we're going to need six times the amount of minerals we, we, we're producing now. When you mentioned de-risk, what did you, can you talk a bit more about that? Are you talking about the supply chains? Uh, what is that? Can you please elaborate? Yeah, I think, uh, look, part of the answer is we're figuring it out as we go. We, we, we're going to celebrate the 50, well, it's not celebrate, that's the wrong word. This year will mark uh, the 50th anniversary of the Arab oil embargo. And as someone who studies energy history, you sort of think about how that shock to the world created a set of mechanisms that came out of it, like the International Energy Agency, for more data transparency. So we didn't have a lot of data on oil markets before, and there were some, you know better than I, some parts of the, the metals market. We saw what happened with nickel and the LME, for example, where maybe we need some more regulation or some more transparency. We came out of the 1970s and we built strategic oil reserves in case there were disruptions. Now it's, I think, much more complicated to think about how you would build strategic stockpiles of, of minerals, and of course there are many different types of minerals and, and how they would, but when we think about, we should also say that the risks we are concerned about, I think, are different. There's a difference between the daily flow of energy if oil supply is disrupted, your ability to move your cars today, that is different than if there's a disruption in the supply of copper or lithium. That would lead to supply chain problems. Costs would go up. You might find it harder and more expensive to buy a new electric car. It wouldn't affect your ability to drive whatever kind of car you have today. So the risks are different. We need to be really thoughtful and precise about them. Um, it is also the case that there's much more concentration with where the minerals are produced. So the largest producers of oil in the world, the US, Saudi Arabia, and Russia, each between 10 and 15% of global supply. The largest producers of lithium, of cobalt, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and uh, lithium, cobalt, uh, and nickel, um, each of them produce more than half. The largest producer produces more than half of global supply. So there's much more concentration. And I think that, uh, that raises uh, a lot of potential security concerns. And we're seeing that particularly what I mentioned, given how much of the refining and processing happens here in China. I just co-chaired a task force that developed a critical mineral strategy for the US. I briefed lawmakers on Capitol Hill about it. And that dependence on imports, but particularly dependence on China for imports, is one of the things that if you're in Europe or in the United States, is top of mind for policymakers. Now the question is, so what do you do about it? It is simply, and one of the findings in this task force report we'll put out, was important to say, it, it is not possible to do this without being integrated into a global economy, without a huge amount of global trade. And China's gonna play an important role in that. So we need to think about what it looks like to reduce the risks of supply disruptions, whether it's intentional and geopolitically motivated or because of a accident of nature or anything else. And uh, that could, I, I think, you know, when, when you think about where security of supply comes from generally, whether it's oil or minerals, or steering wheels if you're an automaker and you're worried that 90% of your steering wheels come from one supplier. Um, you wanna think about diversification. That's sort of first and foremost, right? When uh, Winston Churchill famously moved the British Navy from coal to oil, he was famously said, you know, security and oil supply comes in variety and variety alone. So diversify your supply base. Potentially think about 
uh, the kind of inventory levels you have, whether they're private commercial inventories or government uh, stockpiles. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of innovation and R&D uh, can play a role in this for imp improved recycling. If we can grow the gr reduce the growth through new battery chemistry technologies, uh, through recycling, that can help as well. Uh, and trying to make sure we have stronger partnerships. Part of the thing I'm worried about in the United States is that one of the few things both Democrats and Republicans can agree on is that free trade is not in fashion as much as it was before. But if we want to build secure supply chains, we need more partnerships and trade agreements uh, rather than, than fewer. So I think those are some of the things that, that, uh, that government should be doing. And again, we spell out some of those in these recommendations we released. It's part of what the EU mineral strategy uh, is doing. I'll make a quick comment just about numbers. And if uh, whoever has a question next, we can go ahead and move the mic to you. But to give a context around the numbers, because I'm like, scale of this challenge, what are we talking about? If we want to get to net zero and we follow, let's just go with one. The International Energy Agency has their net zero pathway. And you look at the increase in the amount of annual production of lithium. We focus on this a lot when we talk about batteries. It's a 450 times increase. I think it's 456 times increase. Um, off of what, if my memory serves, 100,000 metric tons base that we have today, the number that really blows me away is a different one. It's copper. Today we produce, I think it's around 20 million metric tons of copper. We talk about electrifying everything. What does that mean? A lot of wires. And we're talking about an 8x increase in the production of copper. That is massive. And with that, when you talk about risk, I think about how do we build all of the mines and the entire supply chain we need to create that. And within that, there's a bunch of different <coughs> questions, including a social justice question and community engagement. A little holes. Yep. And so when you think about that, the conversations we're involved in with local communities are, yes, we had a mine here in the past. Cool. The next mine, what's in it for us? How are we going to partner in this? We're not interested in a school, a road. We're talking about full development. And we've seen some of the trade-offs, and here's how we feel about it. Here's what we're willing to do next. And those conversations are complicated and important. And so when we talk about risk, there's geopolitical risk, there's technology risk, but there's this type of social risk as well as we develop out the next rounds of mines and the entire supply chain to go with it. You know, one more data point. In the United States, 97% of nickel reserves that we know of, and you know, again, like, we, like with oil, there's probably reserves we don't know about yet, and that's part of the role of technology. But existing known reserves, 97% of nickel, 90% of copper, 80% co copper, of lithium are within 35 miles of a Native American reservation. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the potential impacts from large scale increase in mining for local communities, indigenous uh, communities, tribal communities, you know, frankly, the mining industry has a mixed track record in how it's engaged with those communities. And that's just going to be critically important to get right for equity and justice and to do right by those communities, make sure they benefit economically, and also just for the social license that the industry needs to scale. At the, at the rate we need to. Can we get a mic up here, please? Thank you so much. Okay, I'm Yang Li from uh, Peking University. And uh, I want to ask a question about the renewable integration, you know, with higher and higher share of the renewable solar and wind. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming a totally different challenge for. Uh, good news is they are cheap, but uh, the challenge is uh, the sea term cost are increasing or fast. So I want to hear your comments about this uh, situation. OK. Jason knows I spend a lot of my time on this, which is why we just smiled at each other. Um, absolutely. So when you look at all the analysis around how we get our electricity systems, which are the backbone of this whole transition, to net zero, so how do you get the emissions down in that? What you find across all of them is that if you want to be affordable and reliable and clean, so all three things in the future, you actually need three different types of technologies. We focus on solar and wind a lot. That's a bucket one, variable renewables. When they're around, as you say, they are so cheap. We want to use them, like we absolutely do. But they can't do it all alone. So we complement them with storage, not just batteries, but other things as well. We talked about hydrogen a little bit earlier, but different ways to store energy over long periods of time. Net result is that's still not enough. We need a third type of technology, which is firm dispatchable power. Things that can be around 24-7, 365, whenever we want them. So these are technologies that are not spoken about as much. In some parts of the world, they might be geothermal or very big hydro, if you have that resource. It might be nuclear power, which is a different conversation in different countries that I work with around the world. And even within the US, in different states and different communities within those states, it's a different conversation. And what you see is that 
you can't just have variable renewables, even if you back them up with storage, if you want it to be affordable and reliable and clean. You need that third bucket. And you might actually need a couple of complementary players, which is the third player, which is to say, you know, in this particular place, it is too expensive to get the power all the way to net zero, so we're going to offset it in some legitimate way, whether it's direct air capture or a nature-based solution or something else. But the conversation so gets focused on wind and solar, that's great. We want a lot more of it, way more than we have today. But we have to complement it with other things, or we end up on this road that won't get us all the way to the affordable, reliable, and clean future that we're talking about. Look at your question. Other questions? You got one in the back, in the middle. Hi, uh, my name is Paulo Savalci. I'm a professor at Oxford. Uh, I, I would like to ask a question about the, you mentioned many technologies that have been developed, green technologies. How can we accelerate? What are the, the governance and policy prospects to accelerate these transitions? And you said uh, carbon tech and carbon management yeah, technologies? Yeah, carbon right. tech. Yeah. Awesome. Do you want to start? Do you want to? Um, I am an engineer and policy person by training, so I can just, uh, we can just have a whole hour on this afterwards. But in the meantime, I'll say a couple of different things. Uh, one, when you look at all the different scenarios, you need some type of carbon tech. You need to figure out how to take that carbon and actually make it into something useful, something profitable. At a minimum, figure out how to store it underground so it doesn't do harm. Um, so when we talk about a bunch of different technologies, um, no offense to the gorgeous country of Iceland, but Direct air capture is just one thing that is being developed. I see a lot of excitement going on in carbon products, and we actually have an initiative at our center uh, to complement some of the work that's going on in a lot of great universities around the world to say, how do we take this thing that is costing us a lot and make it into a value stream, so utilize it. Don't just store it, turn it into a product that you want to see it in. So this could be something that um, some of y'all might have seen from carb fix, so something where you take carbon and greenhouse gases and you actually put it into cement to make it stronger and need less of it. That might be one of the things we develop. But there is a long list of ways where we think about greenhouse gas emissions as molecules that we can recombine into things we want and might actually use. Um, it gets incredibly interesting. Yeah. A lot going on. I'll just I'll let Melissa speak to the technology because she knows it better than I do and my own background is in international economics and foreign policy and national security and I just want to emphasize a point I made in the talk because we are brought together here by the World Economic Forum. It is the foremost organization in the world over the last several decades to try to remind people about the benefits of an integrated global economy with careful guardrails and protections and all the rest and the, the, the risk that we are headed in the other direction right now, I worry is, is, is a huge headwind for the clean energy transition. We need a lot more cross-border trade, a lot more collaboration if we're gonna have the kind of energy transition we need to. Uh, so that really does pose a risk to scaling many of these technologies as quickly as we need to. So with that, we are out of time. Probably ran a minute over, apologies to us, but we really enjoyed the conversation and I look forward to following up with y'all. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.